hours ago, we lost a chopper carrying a cabinet minister and his aide from this charming little country. We've got a transponder fix on their position. About here. This cabinet minister, does he always travel on the wrong side of the border? Apparently, they strayed off course. And we're fairly certain they're in guerrilla hands. So why don't you use the regular army? What do you need us for? Because some damn fool accused you of being the best. Dylan! You son of a bitch! What's the matter? The CIA got you pushing too many pencils? Huh? Had enough? Make it easy on yourself, Dutch. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You never did know when to quit, huh? Damn good to see you, Dutch. What is this fucking tie business? Oh, come on, forget about my tie, man. I heard about that little job you pulled up in Berlin. Very nice, Dutch. Good old days. Yeah, like the good old days. Then how come you passed on Olivia, huh? Oh, that wasn't my style. You got no style, Dutch. You know that. Come on. Why'd you pass? We a rescue team, not assassins. Now, what do we got to do? That cabinet minister is very important to our scope of operations in this part of the world. Dutch, the general's saying that a couple of our friends are about to get squeezed, and we can't let that happen. We need the best. That's why you're here. Go on. Simple setup. One day operation. We pick up their trailer at the chopper, run them down, grab those hostages, and bounce back across the border before anybody knows we were there. What do you mean, we? I'm going in with you, Dutch. Handle this show, right? We record in advance and right. say, oh, okay, cool. I'll see you in a couple weeks. And then right. when you tagged me in that post yesterday, yesterday or Monday, yeah, yesterday, yeah, well, yesterday right? yeah. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> it's out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one. I was like, uh, I think I put in the blog post, I guess, since um, uh, earlier attempts to get a chimpanzee with a lollipop fell through. Patrick was available <laughs> that we were able to use him. <laughs> And trust me, we've tried with the chimpanzee many, many times. His demands were so high. Just, I mean, you know, you should, see, just, you should see the uh, the writers in his contract. Yeah, I mean, you know, you do one Pringles commercial, and suddenly it's like you can command the world. I he wanted his bowl of Skittles, a bowl of shit to throw at people, right? You like. know, and that's aside from the one that we throw at each other. You know, it's like, it's like what? what bowl of extra shit, <laughs> right? And then and the bowl of uh, bigger shits that he can throw at his. Uh, Co hosts, <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. hey, but he had a built in following, right? The you know, he had a built in following. I mean, look at his Twitter following and his Instagram following. It's yeah, because like I sure as hell don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one to add. Come on, come on. It, it would have been worth it. It would have been worth it just to take the shit, deal with the monkey. He would have been a lot more entertaining. No pun too. intended. No. <laughs> <laughs> definitely take the monkey. He definitely would have been more entertaining, I think. <laughs> I, I want to hear the, the monkey read some of the headlines. Uh, here in the background. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was just raising hell right now. So you just hear like shit breaking in the background. People love it. People love conflict and calamity. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they like looking at train wrecks you know? <laughs> or even listening to it. Have you, by the way, speaking of train wrecks or lack of, have you seen Terrace House? I, I'm like a whole year late coming into the show. Actually, probably longer than that, but mm-hmm. no. Are, are you familiar with the show? I don't think so. I don't... It's it's on Netflix. It's a Japanese reality show. Oh, like done in the style of the Real World or Big Brother, like three right. three three men, three women live in a house. Let's right. see what happens. Right. That, there's... that there's the age distinction there. If you're old <laughs> enough, you remember the Real World. <laughs> if not, you remember Big, Big Brother. Big Brother, yeah. So instead. So you don't have, unlike how how reality TV is produced here, or even just even even in, in just Western countries, right? right? Like you, you usually have producers. Like it's not scripted, but it's definitely produced. Like you yeah. definitely have producers on the side that are egging 
that are that are um, that are usually assigned to certain you know uh, um, certain participants and 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 they get the participants to like you know egg, you know to antagonize each other right or right. they'll do that in the editing <laughs> editing and I found out that sometimes producers will get bonuses if their their participant or whatever like raises the most shit and and, and stands out the most Jesus, so and the person that did Puck must have been like making <laughs> buco yeah. bucks. Well, I'm pretty sure. I mean, back then of the real world, it wasn't like like at that level yet, right? But mm-hmm. until like we started seeing like Survivor, like Pat, once you get past the yeah. 2000s, you started seeing like, the dude roaming around nude all the time. It's like okay, like like it no longer became reality TV. Reality TV, it kind of became like that that mostly not scripted, but but improvisational right? type of TV. I but with the goal, say, yeah. So, but That's, the thing with Terrace House, this Japanese series, there's none of that. It's just Japanese people being very civil. So if there's a fight, it gets resolved quickly, and 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 people are cool with wow. each other. And oh, that would fail here hardcore. No, but it's a hit. That's the thing. It's a hit. <laughs> oh, because... well, I figure because like Netflix. I mean, like you know, like for you know, like ma- major, you know, like Channel Two, Channel Four, or something like that. <laughs> Would never do something because like, well, why would people watch? But there is, but people forget there's that voyeuristic aspect that we all have, you know. Well, thank you, internet. So, you know. So the articles about Terrace House about like why why they think it's a hit in the U.S. and like why they hit a hit also not just in the U.S. but also like with with countries outside of Japan. Uh-huh. It's because it's they're seeing realistic problems being handled ideally, <laughs> right? And and it's oddly well, hypnotizing. Well, hip- hypnotizing well the, the, the biggest aspect is america as americans we don't like to face our problems yeah <laughs> you know we like to point fingers and say that's the reason why my life's shitty or i'm shitty is because of that person or that thing over there well, especially more so now right well yeah especially <laughs> more so now you know you know and and so now you know when you see people actually taking accountability mm-hmm. people are kind of like whoa that's crazy. You know, it's like, you know, I'm a shit person because my mom didn't hug me enough, but it's like, you know, but you have over there, it's like, okay, well, you know, but they don't want to kill each other. Yeah. They don't want to get along. They're, they're throwing, they're not throwing shit at each other. They're, they're finding not. a way to work things out. So nobody's throwing furniture. I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> I don't understand how this works. Cause you think about it. Like that was, you know, like mid to late nineties, Jerry Springer and yeah. all of that shit. Yeah. Like yeah. you're not the father, Mari Povich, all like mm-hmm. the, all the talk shows, mm-hmm. right? Like, it, when they became tabloid esque, yeah, finger pointing, all the just rage out, and yeah, exactly, and you know, and it's like, it's, so now it's kind of like, whoa, that's crazy, you know. <laughs> well, it's like what you and I were talking about the West Wing the other day. It's like kids nowadays that would look at the West Wing and be like, that shit would never happen. So unreal. What is this fantasy show? This I know, fantasy so unreal. Show so unrealistic. Who talks like that? <laughs> Educated people talk like that. <laughs> Well, what are they? Where are they? <laughs> yeah, I like I said, fantasy. It's all fucking fake news, man. <laughs> fake news. Mm. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Extended Play Movie Podcast. Uh, to the a- fake podcast? <laughs> yeah, <to> the- <laughs> Are we here? The Extended Fake Movie Podcast. <laughs> um, a podcast for true cinephiles. I'm your host, Stephen Vargas, and with me again, Patrick Chan. Hello, hello. You know... <laughs> Extended fake movie podcast. We, we, that's that's that's. There you go. You should that have on top genre. Yeah, you should have a whole bunch of fake movies, and like some, some of these episodes, we actually should just talk about the fake movies, the <laughs> fake directors. Yeah, um, fantasy films. T- go and go like find Titanic two. Go crawl two. Right. Find fanfics. Find fanfics. <laughs> hey, if it worked for Fifty Shades, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, there. Yeah, and, uh, Back to the Future four. You know. <laughs> Like all of those types of movies, you know, uh, Chinatown too. <laughs> all the president's men again, again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> speed three, hell, even speed two. Yeah, yeah I know. Right. <laughs> well, if, wait, if that's the case, then, uh, then live free or die hard or die hard another day. <laughs> that's true. Ooh, uh, how or, the mighty have fallen. Or, um, oh God. <laughs> Would be another another good one for that. Would be something Godfather like, Four. Oh, jeez, Godfather <laughs> Three for that matter. <laughs> um, oh God. Then uh, the second half of Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> in the, in the uh, Crystal Skull. Yeah, because right? yeah, you're not doing Indiana Jones Five. You're doing Six technically, because <laughs> Four was kind of split into two different movies right there. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> 
Avatar 2 because we know we're never going to see actually Avatar well, 2. Not in our lifetime, at least. Right. I mean, James, like, James Cameron will find out a way Well, he's to, a cyborg now, so he, he's going to live that's, out, live everybody. Well, that's why he's working on Battle what is it, on Alita because, you know, it was just his way to uh, <laughs> delve into that world of cyborgs and <laughs> find out a way to extend himself in, in a way. Well, it was like, well, I was in the middle of prepping Avatar 2, and then I came up with this other project. Now it's like, oh, so you kind of did a, a Ridley Scott while you were doing Blade Runner and kind of had this, oh, unicorn. Oh, legend. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, this is how it's going to go with, with uh, Jim Cameron. He's, uh, he's in the process of turning himself into a cyborg so that not only can he finish all the Avatar sequels, but, but they're still not, they're still not going to come out in our lifetime. Right. But he will also find a way to transform himself into some sort of submersible so he can finish his underwater documentaries. And... <laughs> Titanic 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another break in three. <laughs> break, break in three. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, ask your parents. Um... <laughs> wow, Cameron, the man behind Canon. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, so we are continuing on our director series with, if you look at it, it's a very short filmography Yeah, that this director has. Or if we're talking about his, his best film. But right? yeah, it, it, well, if you're talking about his more memorable films, the yeah. first half of his discography is, is you know, uh, pretty great, but... Yeah. You know, because uh, when he hits, he, he really hits. Yeah. Or, and when, when he, he doesn't, doesn't. <laughs> he spends, you know, a year in jail, you know, <laughs> it's entire it gets embroiled in a, in a, in a phone tapping scandal. Mm-hmm. So, and if you don't know who we're talking about, again, ask your parents, uh, <laughs> John McTiernan. Um, we, I mean, obviously the first two movies we go out the gate are the two directors are the two of our favorite movies. Yeah. You know, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. Um, but one of the things that we we definitely uh, learned over the last couple of weeks has been, you know, just the body of their work is mm-hmm. is it's where you're kind of you know with, uh, you know, when you're 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 doing stuff like you know, just you know a lot of movies you say they go oh yeah these movies are great and like with Donner last week was just like yeah you remember Superman or you remember Lethal then you forget Goonies. Yeah. And you forget that Maverick was part of that. You know, you forget, you know, Lady Hawk and you forget all these other movies that they've done. <laughs> the Omen. The Omen. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> the so Omen. Like, yeah. So, wait, you want him to do this kid series? The guy that directed The Omen? <laughs> Scrooged. <laughs> you know, it's... it's <laughs> From the director of The Omen. <laughs> right. Scrooged. Scrooged. <laughs> and, and it's just it's just one of those, like, great type of... Uh, it's kind of a good little treasure trove mm-hmm. when you find a director you like, and then you start looking back and you're like, Oh shit. You start piecing together. Oh, these movies I really liked. Mm-hmm. And they all fall, you know, the same, you know, the, 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 the same motif. You kind of really, it, and one of the things that I think I find and one thing I found with McTiernan as well as Donner, Donner is very great on scope. Yeah. You know, yeah. building the frame, you know, just the, everything was just, and, practical sets and just everything looks so beautiful you know and in the very classic director which i think we 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 lose a lot yeah and it was funny because yesterday i was watching um uh justice league mm. and um i was watching this the scene uh, in justice league when um spoilers if for the most of you that haven't seen it um superman is talking to lois and he's supposed to be on the farm and he's supposed to be in this like you know Waff, uh, this like flowing uh, the rows of cornfields. Yeah, there. something like like that. And you know, you see them blowing, and the the sky is very, very artistically done. Mm-hmm. You know, clouds are just right, and the, not the, in camera. But yeah, like it's just it's just everything is too perfect. Yeah. And then I and when we were doing the Donner episode, I watched the original Superman, of course. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at that, and I go, "Oh my god, it's practically shot." He's standing in the in the row of cornfields with his, with Ma Kent, and he's looking out, and you just see the camera pulling back, and you just see the the skies with this like kind of grayish clouds, and it just looked amazing. And you're just like, oh, I don't understand how people can go CG, and and I understand you have greater control over the elements, but you can just see the difference. It's just so beautiful. 
I think that's the thing because like we we because I mean a lot of that started with Snyder right Snyder was the one like all right let's get everyone on I mean well okay if you want to go back a little bit a couple years before that I guess you had George Lucas who's like let's put everyone in the green screen <laughs> right and, and build build the environment around them but like people were people were so taken by by Snyder's look for 300 right right that that type of that type of set building or that type of look I guess that everything needs to be painted on right kind of stuck with movies after that and I think I think what it is, is that the human like you're saying like you already know even if you know nothing about like how how movies are put together like you already sense that like this is something I'm I'm looking at somebody else's interpretation of a perfect sky right I think that's what it is yeah right? yeah like, I'm not seeing like an, an actual a perfect natural landscape I'm I'm watching what this person's idea of it is. And it's not necessarily my idea. <laughs> right. And, and even then it's, it's just even realistic. Yeah. Like it's like going, okay, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. I've never seen the sky that orange, you mm-hmm. know, in that kind of setting. And, and I get, you know, a lot of times, well, you know, it's cheaper because you just have the actors against the green screen and then they just spend all the time on the digitals. It's like, and it's so much harder for actors to act around. Exactly. It. I mean, you know, like you have Ian, Ian McKellen getting frustrated acting with, with lights yeah <laughs> right yeah in the hobbit yeah where he was just like i i don't act when i'm with myself you know yeah. and and you know and that was one of the big things that i thought was if you really want a straight comparison lord of the rings the hobbit mm-hmm. right then and there you look at both of them starkly different movies even mm-hmm. though done by the same director but you know you look at it and you you see the, yeah, you look the at vista fellowship and then... the fellowship and and um you know the, the the two towers and and then even return to the king with all its endings you know there's <laughs> there is a bit of green screen you mm-hmm. know obviously i mean river rivendale you know and stuff yeah. like that but but not to the point of how the hobbit was done right to the to the hobbit where it was just like okay it was like look like rocks but they're probably covered with green green um mm-hmm. uh green screen material and then just kind of doing that because it looked fake it yeah. looked cartoony oh, yeah. and then yeah. you have fellowship where they're riding horses, you know, mm-hmm. and they're and you just see this big vista, you they're know, in just, New Zealand. I mean, just you know, on on trekking the whole thing, trekking to their next shot location. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, nobody had trucks. They all just rode yeah. horses and they no, filmed nobody, them. <laughs> nobody built a set with with the castle falling apart or anything. Like right? Just, they just they just, they just ro- went to one. They just <laughs> rode to the next set and they go, let's film while we're we're, we're moving over to the next one. <laughs> but you know what? Despite the fact that we're making the statement that like like practical is better, I still have a feeling that if Peter Jackson wasn't so exhausted. And if he actually had the time that he wanted to take right. instead of, you know, rushing into like what he had, like less than a year to for him. Yeah, to go because from, Guillermo del Toro bailed on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think we still I think we would have we, we, we would have ended up with films that we would have been happier. And with. maybe not three. Maybe not three. Yeah, yeah. definitely not three. Yeah. Because that's how you, you know, squeeze that rock. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I think Peter Jackson would have would have had more time to make things less. um I think you would have been able to see more effort. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and yeah, because after that too, it was like right when he got, it was like the lawsuit was all settled and all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, but then, you know, so the reason why I bring that up is because here you have a series of movies, a series of movies that are shot on a big scale, mm-hmm. but practically shot. Yeah. And, and that's, I was, um, there was a documentary that I was watching. that was like, why we love the eighties, 80 movies. And uh, I would have watched the whole series, but it was actually from a it was a, a f- from a French perspective. And who gives a fuck about the French? Uh, <laughs> Trust <laughs> the French. Just, yeah, just the French is the only ones that cares. But the the thing about it was they they were talking about the films because they said that there was something about the eighties before we got into CG, yep. before we got into computer animation. They go, there was something about those movies. Plus, it was you know the the Reagan era and the yeah. optimism that they had, and just the the men being men kind of thing, the Stallones and the Schwarzeneggers that came out and, and all of that. And there was, they were saying that a lot of times with, with those types of movies, a lot of people like them for better or worse, because either they didn't have the money for the budget. So they're kind of campy mm. or they, they did it in such a way that was innovative, unique and the grain of the film. Yeah. And it was practically done. You know, they go, not, you didn't see a CG Stallone in, in, um, first, in first blood, <laughs> oh, you know, or, you know, uh, things like that. 
Well, that was the whole thing. And like, I mean, like, you know, going back to McTiernan, right? I mean, like, it's not that he didn't have special effects, but they were just done so well. And like you said, in camera, like, like the Predator effect. <laughs> exactly. Nobody had ever seen like the, the, that sort of uh, effect that they had for that. But even then, that, that was still done like like in camera, spliced right. together optically, optically, whatever, you know, not used computer. Post Jean-Claude Van Damme. Post Jean-Claude Van Damme. Even like Die Hard, right? Like a lot, a lot of people don't realize like there were there were miniatures used for mm-hmm. for some like the building shots. Yeah, and the fact that yeah they actually blew up uh, part of that 20th Century Fox building, <laughs> you know, with the windows and shit. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's and a lot of that's shot on a soundstage, of course. But you know, so the first film that McTiernan did uh, was a movie called Nomad, which. I didn't see you. Nobody cares. Uh, but it didn't do well. It didn't do well. But I think it starred Pierce Brosnan. Yeah. And uh, it was like the first time he had worked with him. Yeah. And um, so it was, you know, it, it was his first four way. But then, you know, that was 86. And then a year later, Predator. It's just funny. You had to think like, like with the lukewarm. Well, maybe even hated. Right. It wasn't. Norm- I can't remember. It didn't do well. It didn't do well. It didn't no. do well. But I wonder like, like how how he was able to get Predator coming off of such a coming off of such a weaker but then guys I guess Predator was not really expected to do well Predator is really kind of low key mm-hmm. I mean it's it's not when when you think about Predator you're like oh god you know fucking Predator mm-hmm. because you you know of the lineage that came from Predator mm-hmm. but when you look back at the original Predator movie which Patrick and I did actually when we were going to record earlier episodes of this, I was actually had Predator on. Uh, it was on cable, and Patrick and I are watching it, and and we're like, I don't remember all of this before the Predator thing happened. You know, <laughs> the assault on the compound where they meet up with the girl, and and you know they're looking for that other team. Yeah, and, there was a lot more to the movie. Like I remember the I remember those parts being in there, but I don't remember being as <laughs> long as they were. Right, you know, because then you're kind of like, oh shit, and then it's like then you start realizing, oh yeah. The team that fought the Predator, they didn't last long when it was against the Predator, <laughs> but they made it halfway through the movie, you know, <laughs> including Shane Black, you know, <laughs> who, the reason why he was, what was it? Because he, he was trying he, to show him the lethal script, right? Well, he was, was it? he did a pass on the Predator script and uh, because there was, I think it went through a couple of iterations and he wrote a version and then they, McTiernan brought him to the set because he expected uh, Shane Black thought he was going to use him as a writer on set, but he ended up making him one of the uh, one, one of them, the, well, the commandos, the commandos, because he said he goes, yeah, and they ended up tossing the version that I wrote, and I thought that, oh, okay, this is their way of kind of like keeping me hostage, you know, uh, <laughs> for a time. And but this is like, and that's a great cast. Yeah, it's a great, it's, it's a, a great, great, great fucking cast. cast. I mean, obviously Carl Weathers, mm-hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm-hmm. Jesse the Ventura, Bill Duke, Bill Duke, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it's funny too because I was like, going, "Wow!" And all of those, you had two governors, Schwarzenegger <laughs> and, and Ventura. You almost had three if Sonny Landon would have uh, <laughs> would have succeeded in his bid. But why didn't Carl Weathers? I would vote for that. Can you imagine <laughs> Apollo his, Creed wants you. Apollo Creed wants you, or um, just just vote for Action Jackson? You know, it's like. <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, and Patrick and I have, we had this joke about, you know, when he's like, you know, he's like, you son of a bitch when he first sees, uh, and they, they do that, that, that that intense, like, like, uh, uh, like hang right. And they're like, you just see the bulging biceps, the veins and it just, and, uh, Patrick and I thought, oh, we should just like splice in where I come in as Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's, uh, he's, uh, Carl Weathers character. But when they do that, that handshake, it's like, it's, we splice in that seed so you'd see, oh, like, that'd be so Zucker Brothers. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and you just see these, like, Arnold and Carl Weathers <laughs> biceps. You know? It's funny. The, uh, it was cool when, uh, 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 to go to that event for Beyond Fest last year when, uh, oh, right. Arnold was there. Uh, to talk about his, his experience on Predator because uh, Bill Duke happened to be in the audience. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Arnold had found out and, and called uh, Bill Duke to to come down. And and it's just it's, it was great to hear him talk about it because the the Ar- Arnold was the one saying that that um, that uh, there was so much testosterone on, on set. It was funny because at the same time, they were both super squeamish about everything in the jungle and having to be out in the jungle. You know saying? Like, <laughs> like, uh, uh, like, you know, usually you get your meals served through crafty, right? You can get craft services to serve your meals. And, 
and everyone was complaining the first week because they're out in the jungle and even though they kept uh, covers on all, all the food like bugs would find their way into oh, the food right. <laughs> and then how they were just and, and Arnold was joking around about how the, how prissy they were and just like oh send that back we're not going to eat this <laughs> and then and then they were so exhausted and so just did not care about anything by like the second week on they're just like oh alright there was more protein for us <laughs> <laughs> high protein in these meals and then, and how everyone would toss jokes at each other to sort of up the testosterone but to really just uh compensate for things <laughs> it was just funny to hear that from arnold's mouth too. yeah wow <laughs> I, you know and it's funny because like this and the next three two movies that we're going to talk about kind of to me in a lot of ways set a staple of how i view action movies or political thrillers yeah. or something oh, like yeah. you know it, because here you have Predator as kind of one of the pinnacles of, you know, um, alien action, suspense thriller with right? alien, because it's not, it's an alien movie, but not quite. It's definitely not sci-fi. Well, it's really, it's, yeah, it's not so much sci-fi, but it's really like, like a monster film. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes, exactly. It's more of a, uh, of a, uh, like, a, like, a, like a Dracula kind of yeah, like a like a Jason Voorhees where you got somebody who's like going yeah. and killing everybody in there, and and um, Arnold's the virgin girl that makes it to the end of the movie, you know, <laughs> you know, because that's the trope, you know. See, it's if the... that was the pitch, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking horror film, <laughs> right? You remember Friday the Thirteenth? <laughs> All right, so instead of a bunch of teenagers, it's commandos. <laughs> right. Remember the virgin. Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger. Huh? It's like, huh? Okay. Is five hundred million dollars too much for this movie? Or do we like I could probably do it for hundred and fifty. You think so? Because I'm willing to throw five hundred at this right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you know, and you have such a, a, a great cast and a, yeah. and the the way they react to one another and the way they interact and the the te- intensity modes. Because this could be just simply testosterone dudes just you know, doing whatever and then having glorious deaths. Yeah. But when you see the characters, the way they interact and the way they get, yeah. the way they they, you they see, see their bond. death, you, the way they saw their death. Oh yeah, you with know, Bill Duke and uh, Bill Duke, Jesse Ventura. Mm-hmm. You know, you see all that and the way they, they, they're facing that, then you kind of, there's that like, oh shit moment, like, you just see it through their face. And then of course you have Arnold, there, you're one ugly motherfucker. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and and it just it works and it's and a lot of and for for this movie Arnold's Arnold has a lot of dialogue in the first half yeah once it's it, a very quiet film once and then everyone gets once killed. everybody gets killed off well yeah you figure because everybody's dead <laughs> you know but when it gets to that point it's quiet yeah. you know and then some you know you hear him come on come on kill, kill me, me kill, kill me. me come on I'm right here kill me <laughs> you know and then the the aspect of the way they did the 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 predator, mm. who if you have if you if you didn't catch my reference before was originally Jean Claude Van Damme, Van Damme, but didn't like the costume, and uh, yeah. eventually got recast by a very much bigger <laughs> Peter Hall. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's and then the oh my god the makeup of the predator yeah you know just the design of that mask I mean just the, the design the, of that the mask face. Is, the mask is intimidating but then once you took the mask off and you had the the, the rotate the the fluctuating fangs and yeah, all that you're just like oh just, my god I think that was the, the very first note was it Stan Winston Stan Winston right? yeah the very first thing that Stan Winston wanted I'd like I think he said like the first thing he wanted the the actual predator face to have was was him adding the mandibles oh wow and that just <laughs> oh. so um uh Throwing it back to video games, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Ghost Ghost Recon Wildlands. Are you familiar with the game? I've heard the game, but I, I don't think I've played uh, it actually. It's a it's a it's it's another in the like the Tom Clancy series of games. Uh, the, the but Ghost Recon Wildlands is different uh, because it's it's open world. So just mm. think just think uh, GTA GTA with commandos. Right. Right. Okay. So I mean, you have this open world. The world, I'm sold. Like, it's <laughs> it's a great game. <laughs> um. But yeah, like it's uh, you lead like a, a fire team of four, and then like you know the three other characters of the players can drop in and out. You're sitting there uh, capturing vehicles. It's just like you would in GTA, and sort of like you know making your way, um, taking over bases, fighting against this drug Bolivian drug cocaine empire. Oh wow! And um, and one of the add-ons, one of the DLCs, uh, uh, adds a special mission. So the game takes place in Bolivia. Right. So there's a section of the game of the game that takes place in the jungle. 
And one of the side missions is that you go into the jungle and fight the predator. Oh, nice. So they, so the predator is the special boss in this mission. And you also unlock the face camo that, that each of the guys wear, the, the, the glasses, the shirts, the, the, huh. uh, the, um, the caps that they wear. Right. And then uh, when you when you are able to beat the predator, then you then you win like the predator mask. Oh shit! That you can that you can wear. Oh nice! <laughs> but it was cool because like uh, it was just when you fight the predator, it's 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 uh, I think it's Alan Silvestri who did the theme. Yes, yes. You hear his music in, in the fight. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! <laughs> oh shit! Um, but yeah, you know it, it's it's an intense it's an intense movie. Yeah. Um, very bloody. Oh yeah, people uh, being skinned alive. You skinned alive, ripped off, and holes in their chest. You know, it's just like it's. It, Ooh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I just even try. I know, shit. Uh, but you know, it it's it is one of those movies that does not disappoint. Yeah. So, pretty much that starts to write his ticket after this, mm. because right after this, the next year, we got Die Hard. To go from that to that. So wait, you want the guy from Alien, from Predator, Predator. to d- do this one? Okay. Well, it had a lot of explosions and gunfights. Okay, <laughs> I can see that. But if you start to notice with with his with the movies, and I, I've noticed this with uh, with a bunch of the movies that we we're going to talk about, the reason they work is because they're characters. They're not caricatures. Yeah. And you know that's what this that's what I've always thought distinguish action movies from just junk. You know, is you you have a ton of junk movies out there, you know, action movies, but all the ones that stick with you, it's the characters yeah. and 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 the believability, and then that's why I think Predator really worked because of the fact that you believed all of these characters and the fear that came on their face when they were about to when they were about to die. And yeah, stuff they like sold that. it. They, they really sold it, and that's what that's what makes you really enjoy it. And it's the same thing when you go into Die Hard. Mm-hmm. You know, you have Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis selling it. And then, of course, you have the screen um, debut of Alan Rickman, Rickman. you know, um, and then even Alexander Gudinoff, Mm -hmm. you know, Bonnie Badia, Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Paul Gleason, Mm -hmm. uh, Reginald Reginald Val Johnson. Johnson. You know, you you have that. And we have the first appearance of what eventually becomes a McTiernan uh, uh, pull. The, the the cop from uh, Die Hard, <laughs> yeah. the one that was the, I forget his, uh, his I forget name, his though. name, but he's he stands next to Reginald Von Johnson in that he returns as an as a cop alive again, and a different cop, <laughs> a different cop in uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance, mm-hmm. and then we see him again later in um, Last Action Hero. Mm-hmm. But you know that's that's the thing. Like you know, we talked about Die Hard. We won't go with the Die Hard too much extent because you can just go back to one of our past episodes and listen <laughs> to all that. Um, but it's just kind of crazy though, because like like looking back at, at what he's done so far, I mean like you know no nomad tanked, right? Yeah, and then like Predator, like Predator, you know, ended up doing well, right? But still, like even you know they were still drama, kind there's still kind of drama on the Die Hard set because Fox didn't believe in Bruce Willis oh, uh, no, taking over yeah. that, taking over that role. So like I wonder, I wonder if 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 they if they if they had any confidence in the film, even though like Materian had just done Predator, like right. you know, just because they had they now had this this seemingly huge movie with a, a lead they couldn't put their weight behind. I wonder how, I wonder how what, what fo- how Fox was treating Die Hard. Yeah, it yeah it makes you wonder about that. One other thing that I that I that I found when we were doing when we were talking, about, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the Die Hard hmm. um, episode was Bruce Willis was doing Moonlighting at this time. Yeah. So he was doing a G- Michael J. Fox double duty. You know, he was he was working on di- on uh, uh, he, he was moonlight. moonlighting. He was moonlighting on moonlighting, <laughs> and then you know moonlighting on on Die Hard. But one of the things that that was an issue is because they had a movie to shoot, hmm. but they also didn't have their star for a lot of it. Because if you really look at it, he's. He's in a good portion of it, but not in every scene. Not yeah. what. Not eventually what happens later on. But the the reason why the characters work so well is because they expanded everybody else's character to fill in that extra time. That's mm-hmm. probably why we got a really great Hans Gruber. Mm-hmm. You know, and we Hans could easily have been a oh, caricature. He could have totally been a caricature. Um, well, sad to say, look at Jeremy Irons. It's yeah. kind of what it could have been Jeremy Irons' yeah. character in that. But we got a really developed Hans Gruber. Yeah. Um, we also got 
a good development for Bonnie Badia, mm. Reginald Val Johnson, you mm-hmm. know, and, and Paul, that whole dynamic outside was just its own thing right there. And then the trouble within the, in the, uh, in the, uh, terrorist group itself. Yeah. And then of course, you know, um, um, Oh God, Ellis, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, so we, we had a great, it was kind of an ensemble movie. Yeah. Then, yeah. then more of it's a, always billed as Bruce Willis Die Hard, but yeah, yeah no, but it, it was truly, it, an, truly an, an ensemble. ensemble. And uh, and so I think with that, which much like what we had with Predator, I think they probably didn't believe it a whole lot. But then they probably saw, you know, oh, the dailies actually this is looking kind of good, you know, mm. and uh, and then you have that, and then he follows that up with the Hunt for Red October. Yeah. If you want to talk about one eighty, <laughs> you want to talk about a one eighty. It's like, or as the, the as Anthony Quinn said in um in Last Action Hero, three sixty. You did a three sixty. <laughs> It's, no, a one, it's a 180, you moron. If you did a 360, <laughs> you would have been back where you started. <laughs> uh, Charles' dance is so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then you have Hunt for Red October, which I'm sure will be a, a, a stay tuned. Yes. Because, um, and it, it's it's funny too, because when, when Hunt for Red October came out, I didn't really watch it. I didn't watch it. Hmm. It wasn't until probably the last... 15 years that I watched it. Oh. Uh, but when I first came to it, I came to it. Well, I think a lot of it was because I was, a st- you know, Star Wars, Indiana Jones fan. Mm-hmm. I came to when Harrison Ford took it over, mm-hmm. which I love. Philip Noyce, I think did a great job with, uh, Patriot games. And then of course with, uh, clear and present, clear and present danger. danger. Yeah. And that's where it stopped. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's no, you know, when, when they do that, some of all fears movie, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I went back and revisited it because the tone of the Philip Noyce movies um, was very similar to what we saw what, that J. Mc, John McTiernan started off with. To me, to do a military kind of thriller, that's how those movies should be to me. Yeah. It's, it's those Tom Clancy novels. You know, it's like, I, it's so weird with this movie because there is very little action. There there's is, a lot of there's, tension. There's a lot of tension. Yeah. There's a lot, there's of, a tension. lot of tension. Um, well, I, I guess I'm kind of sidetracking for a bit, but like, like the, the thing, so we're talking like the three mentioned, the three movies that we've mentioned so far, actually I will probably have a fourth one to add uh, once <laughs> we move to like the next movie or two. But, but for, for, uh, for most of the, uh, for most of the time I've known McTiernan's work, right? The top three movies of his for me, Predator, Die Hard, and Hunt for Red October. Like I love so much, and because they're, for me, for those three films, there's not a wasted shot. There's nothing wasted. Yeah. You're glued the entire time. There's no wasted moments, that, especially during Hunt for Red October. Yeah, and which could easily be, mm. and and that's the one thing that I started noticing when I was when I revisited, uh, uh Patriot Games and Clear and Present Danger. And then I was watching Hunt for Red October. And one of the things I noticed was pacing. Mm. There is a bit of, I don't want to say a wasted shot, but I think there's just a little long in the development. Mm. But the thing you get with Hunt for Red October, and the one thing that I, I slowly started to appreciate that more, is pacing. Yeah, Everything goes somewhere. No shot is there just for the shot. Yeah. You know, uh you know, we get that quick shot of, of uh, Gates McFadden and um, the maid, and you know that she's a doctor. We got a glimpse of his life. And then after that, we don't see her again <laughs> for the rest of the movie. But everything is, if with him, is it, in the beginning, it's it's a build up his character yeah, to show that he's really just an analyst. And then it's that roller coaster ride of him doing the whole movie going, Next time, Jack, just write a goddamn memo, you know? <laughs> well, it, the, the great thing about, like, the pacing that you were saying about Hunt for October, yeah, and, like, I didn't realize it until a couple viewings in. It's just the way... So whenever whenever uh, McTiernan uh, breaks into a new scene in Hunt for October, in Hunt for October, it starts with a moving shot. Right. And, I've noticed that. And, like, it just... Uh, and he did, a pre- co- he did it a couple times in Die Hard, too. And Die Hard as well. Like when he, when he starts when he when uh, uh, you start breaking into a scene, mm. it just boom. It would whip. Oh right. Something would whip over. Oh okay. Right? Yeah yeah. And like it was it was great that he finally refined that in Hunt for October 
so that when anytime you you go into like you know a new location or whatever it's like boom you're whipping into something you're mm. you're whipping into something yeah. you're following somebody into something right and right. you're and you're it's just kind of that whiplash <clears throat> effect of like oh okay something and and it kind of does it, it it's noticeable that it kind of whips you into like oh, okay what's going on now yeah. and um uh, and again the fucking cast in this movie yeah yeah i mean i wonder i wonder if um if McTiernan had the same problem with because I mean, Alec Baldwin, I knew him. I knew before before Hunt for October. I had only known him for Beetlejuice. Right, right. But uh, I mean, like what, Working Girl, maybe, maybe. But yeah, I only knew him from from Beetlejuice. I mean, like before then, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and he he was an up and comer mm-hmm. at that point because he was still doing I think soaps at that time, right? I think he had just broken into film because I remember he had like. Well, that was the, like Miami Blues, I want to say, or something. <laughs> but that that was panned. But um, but like you have, I mean, Alec Baldwin, James Earl Jones, of course. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, then you have uh, even like the small little bit part, like even like Jeffrey Jones is is the uh, the ship, uh, right? The little the sub builder. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, the uh, the uh, our our favorite cop in Die Hard, right? The uh, the one who comes back for Die Hard. Uh, oh, right, right, yeah. yeah he's, he was he's, one of them. He was one of the guys on the Dallas, right? He's Scott Glenn. Scott Glenn. Yeah. You have, of course, Sean Connery. How can we forget Sean Connery? Mm-hmm. Tim Curry mm-hmm. and uh, Sam Neill. Sam Neill. Uh, I want to live in Montana. <laughs> That's like <laughs> I don't have an American wife. We raise rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> they let me live in Montana. <laughs> but uh it, it, you know and uh it's I mean cuz it's such a great episode because it's as a oh and you have the dude from um, Lethal 2. He plays the Russian ambassador, the oh, uh, diplomatic Jocelyn. diplomatic Diplomatic immunity. immunity. Ben Stiddo, we, uh, we we might have Wait. lost another sub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to tell me that you've lost a sub again? Even that actor, I can't yeah, remember, he uh, was... from, from, uh, from uh, Logan's Run. The, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in Logan's Run. He was also, if you're a fan of uh, 80s comedies, he oh, was also oh, uh, 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 Secret, uh, Secret of... My Success. My success. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and that's what I knew him from at that point. And then I hadn't seen Logan's Run. Then I saw Logan's Run. I was like, oh, it's that dude. It's like, oh, it's the asshole uncle yeah. from, from <laughs> yeah, Secret of My Secret Success. Secret of My Success. Um, but it's such a, Richard Jordan that that yeah, ah, yeah that's his name, and it, you know you have oh and um oh god that's uh, right Peter Firth was in this yes there was there's oh my god um there's so oh Stellan Skarsgård yes yeah he was the <laughs> sub guy he was the guy that was after Captain uh, Dupulov yeah where he's like no you killed us you <laughs> arrogant asshole <laughs> there's no room for Dupulov's heart for Dupulov himself <laughs> I mean you know oh Fred Dalton Thompson I forgot he was all. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's really just a who's who in this movie when you really look at it. I mean, um, oh God, uh, Courtney P. Vance. Yes, that's right. Yeah, he was the uh, Seaman Jones. <laughs> you know, uh, Timothy Carhart. I forgot mm-hmm. about. Yeah, you know, Fred Dalton Thompson. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Daniel Davis. I love I love him. He's not in <laughs> I enough. I, for- I forgot Rick Dukeman came back for this too. <laughs> He oh yeah, the, yeah. He, he was the, yeah. he was that guy. Yeah, talking about barfing on, yeah. the, uh, on the. Oh, this is nothing. You should have been one of the over the North Sea. Oh, yeah, Snickers bar. Exactly. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's that movie where if you love, oh, I didn't know. Uh, oh, Sven Oldornson. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was on the. Uh, yeah, the Russian. Uh, yeah, and he Arnold. Was Arnold the, wasn't the even singing. in this. <laughs> Arnold wasn't even in this for him to be there. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's it's such. A great and uh, to me, this is one of those movies, and I think a lot of it is because of the fact that you know we're we're so far uh, removed from it that all these people that we see are people that we've seen mm. like a like a hundred times, <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, he it, it was it's one of those movies where it's like every person that's in it is an actor that you've seen somewhere, yeah. so it it. It extends like everybody a little carries weight. Yeah, everybody carries weight. So it, it kind of shows you that kind of scope of a movie. Mm-hmm. To me, that's what those political thrillers were. And that's like the Tom Clancy ones where you always saw, you know, certain actors playing certain roles. And you're just like, oh, man, this. Per- oh, God, this this guy's in. It. Oh, God, this one. You know, it, it's just that kind of thing. And, and that's one of the things I really I really have learned to appreciate more. Hunt for Red October. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, 
I, and you know, I probably would have saw it as a kid and probably been like, oh, that was kind of cool. You know, I liked it. But as I got older, obviously, I'm going to appreciate it a lot more. And that that's one thing. And this is definitely going to be a stay tuned. Um, they've been playing it a lot on on um, on the cable movie channels lately. <laughs> so, you know, I'm one of those and I'm always hitting it right, you know, turn it <laughs> on like right there. And, you know, hearing Sam Neill, I guess I'm not going to see Montana. Uh, and then I one thing I liked. And I, and and this I kind of I thought was very clever. The Russian sub for oh. the first 15, 20, 15 to twenty minutes is all spoken in Russian. Yeah, and that and technique. then and then John McTiernan uses the technique when he's talking to the political advisor because Peter Firth is reading the verse. Yeah, and then it, the camera um, does a slow zoom into his lips, and then suddenly he starts speaking English, and then it pulls out, and then suddenly everybody speaks everybody English. 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 <laughs> so, and then we don't visit the Russian part again until. Um, until the, the Alec Americans Baldwin, and, and Alec Baldwin, and and um, Sam Neill. I'm mean, not Sam Neill. Um, uh, Scott Glenn get onto the Russian sub, and then they then they talk r- Russian just for a second, and then it goes back to English. <laughs> so, and that's the one thing that that I've always kind of thought was cool, and was one thing that actually bothered me about Star Trek Discovery, is a lot of the Klingons in there spoke Klingon. The problem was is they didn't speak the Klingon that we're used to. It was very enunciated, and it kind of it pulled you out because it kind of slowed the scene down. Oh. And so had they done it similar, like it, it took a, it took away from what they were trying to say cuz you're focused on what's the yeah. actual I guess execution of the Yeah, language. and the, the and it was just kind of slow and kind of, but there was one actor who plays <laughs> Sean Connery speaking Russian. Oh, Russian I know, right? <laughs> uh but they have this one guy that plays Ash Tyler who the way he speaks Klingon is actually pretty badass because he talks normally like this, and then when they go, when he goes to Vol, her voice gets like this, and and he, but his face doesn't change. Like you just hear him talking, you're just like kind of not struggling to get like the he's words not out. struggling it. And like Adam and I were always like, God damn, that's good. Like <laughs> like like he's been good, but like everybody else is kind of struggling like struggling with it, struggling with it. And you're kind of like, oh, this like hurry up, let this scene go. And then I I remember watching. Hunt for Red October and I go, why don't they do that? Why don't they do something subtle that changes like, oh, now we're going to speak English because it's going to be easier for everybody to get through the scene, you know? So, you know, it's that kind of thing. And, and I thought that this was, this was uh, really, really cool of how they did that. Mm-hmm. Um, following up into the next one was Medicine Man with Sean Connery. Yeah, yeah. And Lorraine Bracco, I think? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, so... I hope for, I used to I, always get that confused, Medicine Man with uh, um, the island of Dr. Moreau for some reason. <laughs> I'm like I, Brando, re- right? I really don't know how you can do that, but I'll I'll, I'll leave Brando that to you. And, and Val Kilmer, Val Kilmer, like, right? Yeah, so we got the tin foil. The one where, where yeah. the one where uh, Brando is like uber big. Yeah. <laughs> and also, you have uh, right. It's the one with uh, Sean Connery and the pet monkey. <laughs> Isn't it? It's that, that right? Funny. Yeah, with the, the the pet monkey with the. Um, with the lollipop. <laughs> That's why he wanted so much money. That's but how he's still alive, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, because he became a cyborg. He worked on a Jim Cameron film. Uh, That's he was right. one of the right. test bundles for Avatar 1, <laughs> became a cyborg that way, right. and retrofitted. And right. Now, now he is a radio monkey. <laughs> radio friendly monkey. Radio friendly monkey. Uh, <laughs> that, needs, that needs to be a title that is, right there. I know, right? <laughs> radio friendly monkey. Coming this summer, radio friendly monkey. <laughs> From the producer of Die Hard. <laughs> From the producer of Die Hard. <laughs> uh, this, th- that could be uh, John McTiernan's comeback. <laughs> <laughs> well, he better crank it out soon. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Like, it's, it's, been a, <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> um, I, I, to be honest, I never, I never saw Medicine Man. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember seeing trailers for it and then just kind of being like, eh, no. <laughs> Um, where's the boat? <laughs> yeah, I know. It was like, wh- wh- where's the predator? Where, where's the explosion? Where's the <laughs> awesome uh, uh, toupee that you got, Sean Connery? Exactly. Um, but then he followed up the the later, and Medicine Man didn't do that well. No, it 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 it, it seemed well, except for the next. I think the next one we're talking about. Yes. actually, no, even the next one we're talking even about. Even the next didn't film really... didn't do that well. <laughs> but kind of redeemed itself today, I think. But everything yeah. else after that, kind of. Well, yeah, it was definitely ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about Last Action Hero. Yes. Uh, 1993's Last Action Hero. Yeah. Uh, yes, that Last Action that's Hero. That's Last Action Hero. Uh, McTiernan teams up again with Schwarzenegger mm-hmm. and pulls in a lot of people for this movie. <laughs> um, I remember, I and sometimes I always get this confused with uh, Last Boy Scout. <laughs> um, because it was around the same time, and I remember Shane Black having... 
done a pass at this script. Mm-hmm. But then I got it confused with last act. Um, uh, l- you know, my blue last collection, they're right next to each other. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so easy to find. Because it's alphabetical. Uh, <laughs> because um, I always confused it with Shane Black's last Boy Scout who got a big payday for that script. Mm. Um, Cause I remember at the time it was like the biggest, biggest payout. It was like one, it was like a million yeah. something on that. This was in the late eighties, mm-hmm. you know? Um, actually I knew a, a girl in my drama class when I was in high school who auditioned for uh, the daughter. Oh really? That, uh, that uh, Bridget Wilson ended up getting uh, that role. Yeah. The one in um, no, last action hero or you mean, no, I mean, in, oh, um, last, last boy, boy scout. scout yeah. That, Dan, is it Daniel Harris? Yeah, something yeah. like that, yeah. But yeah, I uh, actually, uh, I knew a girl who auditioned for that. And I was, <laughs> then when I saw the movie, I was like, oh yeah, she, no, she wouldn't have been able to do that. <laughs> she was too, she had that too... She too nice? Too cute girl next door kind of yeah. look, little freckles. You and, needed, they, they did a great casting with Dan, you, Danielle, who they actually got. Like, yeah. You needed someone who, who could be a daughter, but like she needed to be a brat. Yeah. A brat that you could v- eventually like and, yeah. and have on your side. Not a Jake Lloyd brat. <laughs> <laughs> not a Jake Lloyd brat. <laughs> that's if, a, if a new, that's a new standard. That's a new standard that we're going to have on the show. Is yeah. if, you, if you have a child actor who's just shitty and is just shitty in real life too, that's Jake Lloyd. See, if you had a Jake Lloyd type playing that, uh, the daughter in the last action or last action and last Boy Scout, <laughs> last Boy Scout. that scene when she has like the puppet and the gun in it, right. she would have just shot everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or when she was, uh, when the, 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 the head of the football league was mm-hmm. holding or the head of the football team was holding her yeah. hostage. You wanted him to shoot her. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's fine. Take her. Yeah. Just do it. I don't care. He's been a bitch all the bitch this entire time. <laughs> Um, but going back to the last action hero, um, it was such a meta movie. Yeah. I I remember watching it when it came out and remember it being billed as, of course, an Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie. Yeah. You look at the, you look at the cover. I mean like, yeah. And it's like, and then you, then when I saw it, I was kind of like, oh, like, okay. Yeah. I felt the same way. I felt very underwhelmed. I mean, I, I I definitely did not get it. Definitely not whelmed. But, but underwhelmed. 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 Because <laughs> nobody's ever whelmed. <laughs> I was pretty whelmed of Die Hard. <laughs> yeah, that's not... Actually, even overwhelmed. Even overwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but then I um and keep in mind I hadn't really wa- because I had that because of that feeling when I first saw it I never really revisited it yeah. until recently. Yeah. When we were doing this mm-hmm. um and it was on uh, Showtime so I I was like going oh it's on Showtime so of course you know being the the streaming people that we are i was like going oh it's on show oh i can watch it on the app (laughs) and uh i really really enjoyed it but it was so ahead of its time yeah so meta yeah it's very very meta. it's it's mctiernan who if you look at the 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 couple movie the past movies that we talked about with him and then of course with donner and stuff like that he's deconstructing the action the action genre right there and i can kind of see where shane black's influence is kind of mm-hmm. aside from the fact that it ha- once thing happens at christmas um you know uh, so many michael came like oh michael came in and michael score, came in like, the score in there even he's spoofing he's himself. spoofing himself in there and it's just and arnold who's also at the time big action hero mm-hmm. it's around you know he had just done twins yeah um and he's starting to kind of break the, and that was one thing i was really i really started thinking about with schwarzenegger and the, the top the top three at the time was like you know well you know the planet hollywood mm-hmm. uh, uh, willis schwarzenegger and stallone. and stallone schwarzenegger was always willing to take that step to yeah. do something different yeah because i think of all of of everyone in there he knew where, like Jackie Chan, he knew where his the, the 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 longevity of his could go. If he didn't branch out and do stuff, he could that you know he could end up ha- suffering from what Stallone did for for a long while. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Stallone did, I mean, Stallone did Oscar um, that one. But I actually liked Oscar. I really really dug it. But see the thing with the thing the thing with Schwarzenegger and and like and like you also said with Jackie Chan is that they. You always got a sense, no matter what the role, that they were having fun with it. Right? Mm-hmm. Even Terminator, right? Yeah. Even Terminator, there's a sort of like, even though he's just big hulking machine, you could tell he was having fun with it. Yeah. Um, and that that you never got with you, Stallone. And, you kind of never feel that Schwarzenegger phones it in. 
No. You know, even with Genesis. Yeah. You know, he he still <laughs> he still tries. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things I kind of like about. Or he's starting. He does the character. He's doing fucking Kung Fury now. <laughs> and I'm like, first we got Michael Fassbender, and now him. I'm like, I can't take this. They're, I can't um, take it. Um, oh, uh, there. Uh, there's a movie that I saw last year that he was hilarious. Killing Gunther. Oh, I saw something about that, but I want. I was Killing like, Gunther was hilarious. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Killing Gunther is a movie, uh, independent movie starring Arnold that came out last year. That fo- it's it's um, the setting is supposed to be like a re- like a documentary crew mm-hmm. that follows these five hitmen to take out the greatest hitman of them all, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, or his his Gunther. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a comedy, as you might imagine. Oh, figured <laughs> of the super you know, of these five. Five out of the luck uh, hitmen trying to take out this this one <laughs> just for that title, and it's just he's hilarious in it. But yeah, like you said, you never you never got a chance. You never you never felt like he was just doing it for the check, or you really felt like a true joy in everything he was doing. And it's actually one of the great things. I know we're kind of stepping away from McTiernan and going to Schwarzenegger now, right. but um, that was one of the great things about reading his um his uh, biography. Oh uh, yeah, it was just you. He was always a person to seize those moments. And like, you always had the feeling that no matter what he was like, what he was during his struggle, he was always appreciating every step of his ride. Like through, through weightlifting and through, through coming over here, not speaking a word of English. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and still how, not. <laughs> and how clever he was in, 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 in making things work. Like he had a um, quick, okay. Quick, quick side, uh, quick sidebar quick anecdote. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, he had, um, uh, he had come over here. Uh, uh, it's just uh, he had come over here. Was studying at Santa Monica College in the process of learning English. And I'm like, well, if we we don't we don't uh, we don't you know we the, he was friends with a bunch of other bodybuilders at the time and sort of like, well, they're trying to find a way to make money. And like, well, how what how what can we do to make money? And and Arnold was the one who came up with the theme of of coming up with a uh, uh, um. Uh, with him and his friends, bodybuilder friends, sell, uh, marketing themselves as like handyman construction guys mm. that were like, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that would like these Mr. Olympia types and, and, and creating like a theme around it. And that became a hit that became his bread and butter for a while as he was struggling. Oh, wow. And it's just little clever things like that. I mean, he was always good about, you know, and it's just and he came to the right country for that. Yeah, he came to the right country for that. But he was just, he was just. You always got the impression that he was just having fun with whatever he was doing. He was just very oddly humble. Like, because, I mean, we he, know, especially. Will, the thing is, is that, you know, a lot of times people play him as a dope. Yeah. But he, he's, he's, he's actually he's super, super clever. He's really clever. He's always in on the jokes, yeah. particularly with Last Action Hero. Yeah. He is, Even Terminator 2, right? And like Terminator, <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's like he's he's very much in on the joke. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you see Last Action, I mean, he plays plays himself. Mm-hmm. And, it, well, you know, when he's like, where are you going? He's like, I'll be back. I bet you didn't think I was going to say that. <laughs> so you say that in all your movies. Oh. Huh. You know, and then when he comes back with the doobie doobie, yeah, I forget what it was. <laughs> it's like, but you didn't know I think I was gonna say that. <laughs> like, ah. um, but you know, it, it's you know he plays on that, and and then the little, the little moment that that McTiernan got with him with um, uh, that whole when uh, Steel uh, realizes he's not a person. That mm-hmm. he's just a figment of somebody's imagination. Mm-hmm. That he has no, you know, he's like, I'm nothing. I'm a nobody, mm-hmm. you know. I and it's that little moment of it, kind of like, oh, that's like kind of a sweet little, yeah, innocent, innocent little moment that it was like, you know, he was able to steal and able to kind of to to have. So it was just kind of like, you know, he was able to get that from him. And then you know, but then again, you know, we go with the the other act the the other actors in this movie. I mean, it's like really kind of a who's who. Yeah, Anthony Quinn of all people. Yeah, F. Murray Abraham. F. Murray Abraham, who's great. <laughs> like, how do you get Salieri to, to, to be in your film? Right? <laughs> What's hilarious is even you know it's it's one of those things where it's like, don't trust him. He killed Amadeus. He killed Mozart. <laughs> he killed- <laughs> and it's like what the movie Amadeus? He's like, <laughs> and then when they finally hear one of his pieces in the real, real world, yeah, <laughs> it's, like, oh. it's the guy who killed Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the guy that. Uh, Patience killed. <laughs> yeah, patient, oh yeah, the guy that patience, patience killed. killed. <laughs> um, Mercedes Rule. Yeah, you have, um, and then of course, yeah, Charles Dance mm-hmm. was a great villain in this movie. Wondering of of how much of his direction was that he was supposed to channel Rickman. 
I don't. Uh, yeah, because there's moments it's, you, you spot a little Hans Gruber in some of his uh, in some of the scenes. He's very sophisticated, but he's also and polite in some cases. And too, polite in like, some <laughs> cases, yeah. They was very polite in some cases, and also very self aware. Yeah, you, you see within the movie that he's kind of bigger that like, and it works because of the fact that you know him going into the real world and then st- understanding how it works and then realizing you know that's kind of how you, you couldn't be a two dimensional character and go into that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you you have his kind of, you know, how he saw things and, and everything. And it just, you know, and it's Charles Dance. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, well, there was one shot that I thought was kind of interesting because after he kills, uh, spoiler alert for like a almost 30 year old movie, um, <laughs> you have he has where he he just killed Anthony Quinn. Mm. And then he starts talking about his plan mm. In there, and you're like, who is he talking to? In the shadow, in the glass of one, because he follows the camera. In the glass reflection, you see the camera move around it. It's pretty blatant. Oh, so it's kind of like I didn't pick. I didn't pick. I didn't pick up on that. I I saw that. I saw that. And I was like going. I go. Who is he talking to? I go. And then all of a sudden, you see the camera reflection, and it's kind of blatant. It's not one of those that you would normally like. Oh, blink and you'll miss it. It, it it's there like it's in that panning shot and he's looking right at it as he's talking to it and i was like he's aware like you know that the camera's falling because he's talking to the camera you know not to himself so i thought that was kind of interesting and then seeing that i was like was that intentional like that because it's not one of those like oh if you freeze frame it you'll see it yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's there for a good couple of frames so I, i'm just kind of wondering because it is it's one of those where it's like, was that a, an, a mistake? Because or, it works. With because the, it works the with, within the narrative, or was it an intentional? You know. Oh. And then, of course, we mentioned Michael Kamen because he does the um, he does the score in there. But there's the one scene if, for you Lethal fans. It, <laughs> a couple of scenes, actually. A couple of scenes, yeah. yeah you know, the the um, they go to uh, uh, what an steals an older, uh, an older uh, African American cop, yeah, and a younger, younger white uh, hot co- shot rookie white cop. white cop, and you have them going to Steele's favorite second cousin's house, played by Art Carney, yeah. and uh, there he goes, "It's a bomb!" They get away. The house blows up, very similar to what happened in the original Lethal. <laughs> and then the kid is the kid reminded me of Patrick and me. He's like going, "He's all right." The other two cops are dead, <laughs> and then the one older black cop is in a palm tree, looks down, and he's two days to retirement. <laughs> And then you hear, of course, the Dan-ay. the sad guitar. <laughs> You're like, ah. And some of those other scenes too, like you, you hear that you hear Michael came in making fun of his earlier scores, where you hear that, uh, like, well, instead of a tr- uh, sometimes he'll, he'll use a bass guitar versus like a sax, <laughs> right? <laughs> and like, he probably oh. couldn't probably couldn't get Sanborn, you know. <laughs> um, but then there's also a reference to McTiernan's Die Hard in in there when um, in a scene where they do a head-on collision mm-hmm. in the real world. And uh, the henchman is killed, but the other guy is still alive. And he's telling him, go check to see if the other guy's dead. And Arnold's like, no, he's dead. Nobody can get away from him. He's like, really? Because like in Die Hard, the guy had a chain wrapped <laughs> around his neck and came back later to shoot up. <laughs> so it, it's like, yeah, we're making references to those films. Or even the uh, the Gruber fall, right? Oh, that, right, that yeah. Arnold that Arnold had, had that, from that the Long Beach oh, Hotel. shit, as he's falling. <laughs> you know, and... Of course, there's a lot of one-liners in there, mm-hmm. a lot of jokes, um, but it's such... And then a, an animated cat played by Danny DeVito. Yeah. Um, of course, the, it, it, look at the uh, when they enter the police station, too, because you'll see Sharon Stone, Stone Papa, and Robert, Robert Patrick, Patrick pop in there. Um, an, uh, an uh, old um, Humphrey Bogart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> black old and white. Of, right? Old black and white Humphrey Bogart. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's... The captain, the tradition, the the stereotypical mm-hmm. captain who's you know comic relief, <laughs> um, but it it really is meta. It, it really takes an examination of that, and I think it's a film that would be more appreciated now than it was back then. And yeah. keep in mind, this is in the early nineties, yeah, so cause it came out at a time when 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 it doesn't it wasn't really known. Like, oh yeah, you're allowed to make fun of yourself. I don't think right. like people in general were that hyper aware. Of of because I mean now we live in a culture where it's sort of like okay we it's 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 um it's good to look back and think upon things and be introspective and, and learn how to laugh at yourself I mean I, I that's 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 
that might be something that you know that's been practiced for a long time but it's not really something that's really been talked about and said like it's okay to laugh at yourself i mean this is this is something like like recent 10 years yeah right so like for for to have a movie that that'll do that and to have these stars that'll do that was like you know the audience at the time it's like what the fuck are you guys doing yeah (laughs) right yeah and and this was expected to be a huge hit because at this time it was with everybody involved yeah everybody involved you have um you also have um schwarzenegger starring Mm. it bombed yeah bombed at the box office um so it kind of stings mctiernan for a little bit yeah um but then two years later, he goes back to the well mm-hmm. and goes back to what he made fun of before with Die Hard with a Vengeance. Um, <laughs> arguably the second best Die Hard. Yeah. It, it, I have to admit, it grew on me. I, it's it's Because it was as, so different. It was so different. Yeah, it was so different. It it, 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 was, it, felt, it felt like a solid film. But it didn't it quite did, feel like a Die Hard it film. Did, like it almost didn't need to be a Die Hard movie. Right. You could have done this movie... Called and it something and else. called it something else that just happened to star uh, Bruce, Bruce Willis, Willis yeah. and Samuel L. Jackson yep. and have McTiernan directing and you have a movie. Yeah. You know, the only real tie to it was Jeremy Irons' character, yeah. who conveniently plays Han, Gru- Han <laughs> Gruber's brother. Simon? Simon, yeah. Did you go from Hans to, to Simon? Simon? Yeah. I can think of another German. Well, maybe, <laughs> Simon, just maybe Simon is a German name. Yeah, who not, knows? Who knows? Not good with names um, and etymology. But, you know, and, and I mean, it's Jeremy Irons. It's like <laughs> you could have done worse, you know. <laughs> um, Simon says, "Go to the corner store," and you know, and it's a lot of big action sequences, subway sequence. Yeah, the opening shot, the opening sequence. Yeah, one yeah. Of, one of the things that really kind of shook me, and Patrick was mentioning that it made him jump when he was a kid too, was you know, it's uh, summer in the city. You got that song going, you know. And then it's showing it, shots of random shots of uh, of um, New York at the time, and then ends with just a. Yeah, the timing of it, if it's great because that the, it plays just long enough. It plays just long enough for you to get into the song. You're right. Like, oh, okay, it's the song. Yeah. Somewhere and you, in the city. You, you start to you sing. You get into it, the, and then boom. <laughs> yeah. Then it's just a hug, and you're like, "Oh shit!" Yeah. <laughs> and so you you get that moment of where you know the explosion, and then. It just jumps right into the story, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and it's it is a good it's a great movie. Um, it does follow great action pacing, yeah. uh, kind of mixing between kind of like like uh, and I kind of thought that was kind of interesting because they kind of went back to I think one of the reasons why it works is because they kind of went back to the original mold where where Bruce Willis wasn't the soul main care because they yeah. kind of had two story split mm-hmm. where you had the the robbery yeah. basically and the subway accident mm-hmm. and all that stuff and then you had you know uh bruce willis and and samuel L. jackson chasing their tail mm-hmm. throughout new york see i think i think the thing that kind of threw me off as to why was why because i have to admit like the first time i saw it like like i thought it was a solid film but i didn't i wasn't crazy about it the first time around i i have to admit i kind of was the same thing and it did grow on me yeah it grew on me too but i it, it, i think i think it's also because and, and I, I didn't realize it until like you mentioned it today with like the first die hard about how about how um about how truly like the first die hard is like an ensemble piece mm-hmm. and then the second die hard didn't feel that way i mean you have its own characters and like you know like bill sadler was great Right. Like, he was a great villain, right? And and John John Amos was great, um, but other than that, I mean, you had Fred Dalton Thompson. It didn't it didn't quite feel as well rounded as the first one does, right? Right. Uh, I, I mean, the only thing that felt diehard about it was the fact that it was confined in, it was confined to a location, and it was Christmas Eve. It was Christmas Eve, right? But other than that, I mean, like it didn't it didn't quite feel like as as a complete. If it was like diehard light, yeah, right? <laughs> right. It was like your friend telling you what diehard was about. <laughs> it was like telephone diehard, right? <laughs> So 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 by the time you get to the third film, like you, you're sort of challenged on what what makes Die Hard Die Hard, right? Right. I mean, and by this time, like you're only two films in, so you really don't know, right? But I think that's why it, it's 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 like you said. Um, for me, that third film, if we had titled it something else, or if I if if, if it wasn't a Die Hard film, I would have probably probably said like, yeah, it's kind of like in the vein of like Last Boy Scout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but with a robbery, <laughs> but not as dark. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, and but that's the thing is, is like you know, it came back and that was a hit. Yeah, it was a hit for him, and and I enjoyed it. I, I looking back on it, yeah, it's become like my second favorite Die Hard. Mm. Um, 
But then after 95, he just kind of had these weird, weird, weird kind of movies that he just started to kind of, you had the 13th Warrior. Anytime you have Antonio Banderas, is going to be like you're <laughs> trying to push your lead. Not necessarily <laughs> going to work for you, especially when he's trying to play, I believe, Middle Eastern character. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I'm trying oh, to think. Omar of... Sharif was actually in that. Yeah. Oh. I, wait, so, so since we had talked about Richard Donner and Assassins, I'm, how close were those films together? <laughs> well, well, the 13th Warrior was 99, so that's like towards the... Was that 96 for Assassins y- then? Yeah, I think it was like, yeah, somewhere around there. So it was that <laughs> around that five-year period when they really tried to push him as, a, uh, as an action star. Mm. And then he does a remake same year of The Thomas Crown Affair. Yeah. Um, which, I don't know, you're trying to do a... a, a remake of a steve mcqueen movie <laughs> i thought it was okay though it's it was it was all right it was all right um <laughs> and then he does another remake right after that uh, in 2002 rollerball <laughs> oh. when you have chris klein who was still riding on that uh american, american pie, pie kind of thing yeah and um then you have rebecca romaine and Ello cool j it's not a recipe for a great movie you're like from Bruce Willis to Chris, Chris Klein, yeah. <laughs> Reginald L. Johnson to L.O. Cool J. <laughs> right. Bonnie Badia to, to Rebecca, Rebecca Romain. Rebecca Romain, Romain at the time, at the time guess, yeah. Right? And uh, so, yeah. Um, and then after that, another year after that, in 2003, he did Basic, which mm. re-teamed, uh, re-teamed uh, McTiernan with uh, Samuel L. Jackson, mm-hmm. but brought in uh, Travolta. Yeah. I still, to this day, get that mixed up with Rules of Engagement for some reason. <laughs> yeah, he's talking to me the other day going yeah. like, yeah, I got to watch Rules of Engagement. And I kept sitting there going, like, why? <laughs> I'm like, Can you imagine? It, was okay. I it was an okay movie, but I didn't think it was neat to be revisited. Like, I still would have, I still would have, uh, can you imagine <laughs> if I was able to see that movie in time? I still would have been uh, ready for this podcast. And I would have been like, yeah. And then when he moves on to Rules of Engagement. <laughs> you're like, No. <laughs> Why would he move no, on to Rules of Engagement? Need. He didn't touch it at all. <laughs> <laughs> he may have seen it. He may have gone to the movies and saw it, but that's Maybe about it. I just would have rather have seen that movie than Basic. <laughs> Which goes right. to tell you how Basic <laughs> ended up. How Basic Basic was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how Basic Basic was. Um, and then, of course, we haven't seen anything from him since then because of, as we mentioned yeah. earlier, uh, wiretapping scandal. And then, and then that, was stemmed, that was stemmed from Basic. Was rollerball? Oh, was it rollerball? Yeah, it was rollerball. He had, um, I think, wiretap one of the co-producers. Yeah, because he Charles Roven. Yeah, because yeah. he thought he was trying to uh, get him fired or something. Like they was trying to mm-hmm. sabotage him in some way. Mm-hmm. I, I'm assuming he was doing coke at the time because that usually was what make you paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> He's hanging out with Joel Silver a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did Die Hard, <laughs> and not that I know, but I, uh, but you know, I have a friend. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so. Um, Wow, that actually went uh, longer than I thought. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so that that's pretty much the the at this point the life and time of uh, John McTiernan. <laughs> um, I but you know regardless of and, and that's the thing is is like when you look at directors and stuff, I think you say, well, yeah, they're, but their latest stuff sucked. It's like that's not really the point. Yeah, it's it's their what projects really t- stand the test of time. Yeah. Because, and still, like, and, I, well, yeah, of course, yeah, they stand the test of time. Because we're I mean, still talking about them. <laughs> we're still talking about them. But, yeah, it, not only that, but it's just, I just, I like, I still, I still hold, even, like, with the with the ones that we talked about with Donner, like, I still measure all movies today by by what we've seen from Donner and McTiernan that we've mentioned so far. <laughs> that we've mentioned so far, right. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing with me is just, like, when I when I consider action movies, I base it off of Lethal, Die Hard, you know, that, yeah. the uh, Predator, you know, those kind of suspenses. If I'm going into something a little more suspenseful, yeah. you know, I'm thinking, like, or kind of, yeah, like, uh, um political intrigue or something like that i look i look for for red october those are those are my movies my go-tos and and a lot of times you know as a writer you're going to revisit movies like sometimes if i want to inspire myself to write i pull all the movies of like my favorite writers Mm. you know where i love the dialogue i love the snappiness Mm. or just the way the how smart it is and i'll watch them and usually that'll inspire me or if i'm like well i want to write something in that vein Mm. i'll watch my favorite my favorite action movies or my favorite dramas rom-coms whatever what have you and then that will give me some kind of inspiration to kind of do it 
you know, to kind of go that route. And that, that's really what these, these are for. These are these the movies that, you know, oh yeah, you know, you just, you know, it's like for, like for Pat and me, Christmas, Die Hard and Lethal, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and shit, we went Christmas Eve and <laughs> saw Die Hard together and Die Hard 2, Die, Die Hard, Hard 2. And, um, but, uh, you know, it, it's that, it's that kind of stuff, you know, it's movies you go to or, you know, just like, oh, these are, oh God, that's on, you know, and you're going to watch it no matter what, even if it's, if it's poorly, you know, dubbed <laughs> for, you know, because it's shown on basic cable. Oh, yeah. I still, it's just, just that shitty dub of Die Hard 2 when it aired on CBS with the not sound alike for Bruce Willis. <laughs> Oh. I mean, I actually appreciated what what did I uh what movie did I watch? There was some movie that I watched. I think it was on El Rey. Mm. And they just did the dropout. Oh, the so dropout. so it was just like, uh. are you kidding me? You know that and I was like, "You know what? I'll respect that more <laughs> than the voiceover of you freaking kidding me?" You right. know, you know, it's like I'll respect the dropout mm. more, you know. Sometimes if you bleep it out, it's actually funny. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, but dropouts you know they still they, yeah like you said they, they still uh, uh hey uh, untouch as much as possible right? the original intent of oh, the word and and for for all of you networks um uh, if you're not actually cable premium cable uh don't show don't show blazing saddles on like basic cable you can it'll just be five minutes long exactly <laughs> it's like the opening because credits. all because all the good parts you're gonna be bleeping out yeah. you know <laughs> or or See, that would be great. You know how, like, adults, how they always have their April Fool's pranks? Oh, they right. should show Blazing Saddles, but have the um, the test pattern sound the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, <laughs> It's like an hour and a half, right? just that. And then at the end, it's they, they ride off to the, to, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. to the limo and take off. <laughs> All right. Well, that is our show. So we want those five-star reviews, people. Give it to us. <laughs> We give want it now. Yeah, exactly. If <laughs> give you, it now. If you, if you do, if you give us those five-star reviews, Patrick will say the Haunted Mansion script. <laughs> so let's, let's, get the, let's make that happen, people. Uh, drop them on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere you get the show, even Google Play Plus. Or, I mean, Google Play Music. Uh, dro- or drop by the blog at itsnotjustanotherblog.com. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, at Facebook. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Let me try that one again. At uh, Facebook, it's just it's not just another blog. Uh, Google Plus and Twitter at just a blog and pod. We want feedback, comments, and suggestions for movies or topics to cover. So send them on over to feedback at it's not just another blog dot com. And uh, you can check out the other podcast that we do every Tuesday. It's not just another podcast, a weekly podcast that discusses news, politics, social media, and other nonsensical topics. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at a middle aged geek and Instagram middle aged underscore geek. And uh, how's that non existent Twitter account going? <laughs> oh, still dead. I should, I, I should, maybe if I can change the Twitter name, I should just uh, probably change it to still dead. <laughs> still dead. You got to figure out the password, though. At still de- yeah, I got to figure out the password. Ooh. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if you ever want to see how empty it is, at Patrick Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, if you're a fan of uh, Instagram, I've been as JS1. That's where you. That's where you will find me. <laughs> All right, that is it. And next week we will return with uh, Christopher Nolan. <laughs> Get excited about that. This one's gone a little long. I'm sure the next one will too, and less movies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so take it easy. <laughs> <laughs>